We thank you for this Sabbath day, which affords us another opportunity for fellowship. But Lord, unless you manifest yourself in this congregation today, we will only have entered into mere ritual and ceremony. So we pray for the outpouring of your Holy Spirit today. I did not come to lift up myself, but to lift up Jesus. So that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart might be acceptable to you. God, once more, be in my head and in my thinking. God, be in my eyes and in my looking. God, be in my mouth and in my speaking in our hearts and in our understanding. It's my prayer in the name of Jesus and for his sake only, amen. I wanna take you back a few years to an old Washington Post article that was entitled Public Dramas, Private toll for the First Lady. This article was written by Robert Woodard back in 1999, Pastor. There, as he wrote his, this particular story, he was taking the readers on an inside look at who Hillary Clinton was, and how she was coping with the aftermath of knowing, not suspecting, but knowing that her own husband, former President Bill Clinton, had been unfaithful to her, and how she was dealing with the scandal that happened between him and Monica Lewinsky. And so on one particular day, August 18, 1998, he begins to talk about how they were on their way to Martha's Vineyard, that vacation spot where they often frequented. But this time, instead of a whole lot of uh, laughter and talking and joking, they were just sitting there, Bill and Hillary, and the atmosphere was very tense and very sober. When one guy by the name of Michael McCurry, whose job it was to observe the president and study the mood and study the demeanor of the president, when he looked at Bill Clinton, he recognized that Bill was looking somewhat disoriented and dumbfounded. When he looked at Hillary, he found she just simply appeared drained. And when he looked at their daughter, Chelsea, it seemed that she was just devastated. After arriving at Martha's Vineyard, Michael McCurry had an opportunity to sit with Hillary alone and to talk with Hillary. Usually on the outside, uh, Hillary was tough and, and confrontational and always seemed to be in charge of things, but this particular time he found her shaken and more transparent and uncharacteristically more emotional. And as he began to Converse with Hillary, she began to express how she was coping as an injured woman, a spouse, and as a mother. And then she asked the interviewer five rhetorical questions that gave him insight into her pain. She said, do I feel anger? 
Yes. Do I feel betrayed? Yes. Do I feel lonely? Yes. Do I feel exasperated? Yes. And do I feel humiliated? Yes. Anger, betrayal, loneliness, exasperation, humiliation. No one welcomes these feelings. Those five words describe the struggle of life living with an adulterer. And sadly, for many today, these emotions are too common. This type of pain, too deep to explain, unless you've been through it yourself. Analyzing her situation, amazingly, she concludes that God has had his hand in it. And she tells one of her friends, I've got to take this. I've got to endure this punishment. I don't know why God has chosen this for me, but he has, and it will be revealed to me. If God is doing this, she says, then he knows the reason for this. There must be a reason. How many of you, you know that while you may be going through some dark days, and you may be hitting some pretty rough spots and patches in your marriage or in your home or in your school or on your job, and yes, even in your church, God does have a reason for what he allows you to go through and why you need to go through it. So here we find the backdrop, the parallel that parallels the passage of Scripture we will be considering today, taken from the little book of Hosea. God bringing us into relationship with himself is something that cannot be fully comprehended. And it's often something that is devalued and unappreciated. God is a God of relationships. And it is his desire to bring you and to bring me back into relationship with him. Problem with this is relationships require commitment. Relationships require reciprocity. Relationship requires sacrifice, concern, and care. Relationships is always something that has to be closely guarded. God has been faithful and keeping his commitment to us. The problem has not been with God, but the problem has been with us. For we are prone, no matter how hard we try, we are prone to unfaithfulness. Because Every one of us have our own agendas. Every one of us at some time or another has been wishy-washy and have left God down. Nowhere in Scripture will you see God's love demonstrated in a profound way as it is exemplified and given in the book of Hosea. According to critical scholarship, the book of Hosea is an autobiography, an autobiography, oh my goodness, I should have left that word out of my notes. It's a book of Hosea written about Hosea, written about himself. And you can't help but feel the pain 
as you read through the passages of this book. But it gives us a very vivid and clear-cut picture about love of God for people of God throughout the love for God's people throughout eternity. A love that will not die. This love affair between God and his church is graphically and unusually portrayed in the book named Hosea. There's, there is an account written in this little book which if you did not realize that you were reading the Bible, you would think you were reading one of those salacious and steamy novels sold on the book stands. Hosea is one of the 8th century prophets of the B.C. period. The kings mentioned in this book suggests that his ministry must have covered approximately 30 to 34 years. There was a period, excuse me, there was a period of spiritual declension for both the northern kingdom of Israel as well as the southern kingdom of Judah. Hosea, though not as prolific a writer as the prophet Isaiah, and that's why he's referred to as a minor prophet, not because he was less important than Isaiah, but because he wrote less prolifically, was in fact a contemporary of that prophet. Hosea, unlike Isaiah, Isaiah, who was privileged to write about the disappointing experience that God's people were undergoing, was instructed by God to actually live out this experience in living color. If you please, not only was it very painful experience for the prophet, but it was an extremely embarrassing episode in the life of this spiritual young man, which he was commanded by the Lord to write down in the book which bears his name, where everyone could read about it. I like to picture Hosea as a young preacher fresh out of the seminary, and, and I can understand the embarrassment. When you have to write about things that you are not happy about, things that you are not pleased about, things that you wish nobody knew. I remember when I was quoting, uh, quoting my wife. I was down in school in Alabama, and she was back home with her parents in Ohio, and, and I wrote her a love letter. And uh, while I was at the desk, I wrote another letter. I wrote a letter to my mother. And lo and behold, how embarrassed I was to find out that my love, lovely, soon-to-be wife received my mother's letter, and my mother received the love letter to my wife. I was embarrassed. I like to picture Jose as a young preacher fresh out of the seminary. He had been to Oakwood, or maybe he was in Spicer. He was a single young man, probably in his first parish assignment. Hosea was just happy for the privilege of being in ministry. Hosea took his ministry seriously. Hosea was dedicated and consecrated to the work of the church. Hosea had no time for foolishness or social ventures. Hosea was wrapped up in his work and wrapped up in the Lord. Hosea, it was probably one of his private devotions, in his devotions, that Hosea experienced what every preacher dreams would occur. Hosea actually heard a word from the Lord speaking to him. Hosea chapter 1, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Hosea. In paraphrasing what happened next, the Lord said, Hosea, it's time to get married now. Now I would imagine as a young bachelor that it sounded very good to Hosea. He was tired of being alone. It's not good for man to be alone, you know. The Lord said, Hosea, time to get married. Hosea probably reasoned, well, Lord, I, I hadn't really been given much thought to it, but that's not a bad idea. Been kind of lonely around here at night. And then Hosea began to wonder, who is it that the Lord has prepared for me? And he looked back at the choir. 
Maybe she's in the choir. Well, he wasn't impressed that she was there, so maybe she's in the praise team. Oh, Lord, any one of them will do. Maybe it's the storyteller. Maybe it's the being, I'll take her, Lord. Show her to me. Hosea really wasn't ready for what came next. Hosea, I want you to take unto yourself a wife of whoredoms. A wife who is a whore. Hosea couldn't believe his ears. I'm sorry, Lord. I must have not been paying attention. Would you repeat what you said, sir? Hosea, I want you to marry a whore. I want you to, to marry, wait a minute, Lord. <laughs> I'm sure you can't mean, yes, Hosea, I want you to take for your wife, Gomer. Everybody knew that Gomer was a tramp. Everybody knew that even though she was probably the most beautiful woman in town, you would not take her unto your family and say, here's my new wife. Lord, I, I didn't have Gomer in mind. I, I really was thinking maybe Sophie would do. <laughs> Lord wasn't through yet. Not only do I want you to take Goma, Hosea, but I want you to start a family. Have some kids. Then I want you to listen to verse 2. As translated in the Living Bible. It's rough. This is what Hosea heard God say. Go marry a girl who is a prostitute. So that some of her children will be born to you from other men. This will illustrate to you, Hosea, the way my people have been untrue to me, committing open adultery against me by worshiping other gods. I don't know anything in human relationships that is worse than that. At any rate, Hosea could hardly believe his ears. Yes, that's what I said, Hosea. I want you to marry Goma. The first point I need to make to you this morning in the sermon is you have not really learned to serve the Lord until he requires of you something of you that you do not understand the reason for, do not want to do it, but you do it anyhow because God asked you to do it. It's not necessary for us to understand the wisdom behind all of God's commandments. He's God. His thoughts are not our thoughts, and his ways are not our ways. We don't always understand why God deals with us the way he deals with us, as Hillary said. His relationship with us is not always explainable. Christ's love for us is totally unexplainable. Even angels don't understand it. They look on in holy amazement. We are told that the subject of Christ's love for erring humanity will be the unsearchable topic throughout eternity. It's a mystery. Romans 5, 6 through 8, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for us, the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And we shall never be able to understand that kind of love. So we may not always understand why and how Christ deals with us, but the first step to being a true believer is to take God at his word. Whether we like it or not, go marry that whore, Hosea. Even when I mentioned the word, I, I saw some of you winch out there. Frown on your face. Terrible word, whore. Think of the impact it must have had on this young preacher, Hosea. Up to this time, in spite of his youth, had maintained his dignity, maintained his integrity, integrity as a single man. He had an impeccable reputation. 
among his church members and in his community, but what will folk think now? What will the church members and the saints say? Surely his reputation and his ministry will be ruined. It may be that Hosea had noticed Gomer before. You know, Gomer was fine. It was hard to keep your eyes off of Gomer when she walked down the aisle and passed by. He had no doubt watched her switching down the church aisles before she took her seat. Getting real here. But Hosea had made, as Job says, a covenant with his eyes that they would not lead him into temptation. It's one thing to see evil and another thing to behold evil. I believe it was my wife's grandfather that used to say, you may not be able to keep birds from flying over your head, but you certainly can keep them from building a nest in your hair. We know that Goma was a church member or connected to the church or had been connected to the church at some point in her life because according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, Goma becomes a symbol of the church in this unfolding drama. She may have been at some time a member in good and regular standing, but had fallen from grace. Don't know whether her fall can be tracked back to some type of abuse she had been subjected to in early in her life. Or perhaps her condition uh, can be traced back to some moment of uncontrolled passion that had shamed her and left her with a child of despair. And as a result, her name had been brought before the church board. And because of her indiscretion, she had been disfellowshipped. Or maybe she was just one of those confused church members some of us are familiar with who try to act holy on Sabbath but during the week are like Satan's daughter. The kind of folk who show up for church on Sabbath and praise the Lord on Sabbath but got their own little agenda going on during the week, all dressed up on the outside but all messed up on the inside. You'd probably be surprised if you ran into her unexpectedly during the week. You'd never suspect them of being a Christian if you saw them during the week. You know what I'm talking about. There's a whole lot of saints who ain't. Goma may have been like this, one foot in the church and the other foot in the world. And at any rate, from all that I have read, Goma appears to represent the Christian, listen to the preacher, the Christian who has experienced the grace and embrace of God but then goes back to the past like the drunkard returning to his bottle or like the drug addict returning to his drug. Goma represents the bride of Christ who is offered the pearl of great price, yet like an unfaithful spouse returns to her lover. Or like a dog returning to his own vomit. The image of Gomer is repulsive to us and we are inclined to dismiss her from our presence and ignore her and act as if we do not know her, but we know her. For too often we see her reflection in the mirror of our souls. Oh yes, we know her. Second point I want to make, and I hasten to make this point for the young people's sake, and that is don't ever use this passage of Scripture as an excuse to involve yourself or to associate yourself in unsanctified relationships. Stay away from those uh, with, uh, of questionable morals or unfit characters. There are some things you do not need to experience. There are some things we must learn from example, vicariously, through the mistakes of others. And so Hosea is commanded by God to experience something that nobody should have to experience so that by observing his hurt and his pain, we might better understand the pain Christ Jesus feels when we are unfaithful to him. So being obedient, Hosea marries Goma, moves her into the church parsonage. And sure enough, the busybodies can't wait to share this juicy piece of gossip. It's the talk of the town. It's, it's the talk of the church. Guess, guess what, y'all? What you saying? 
You won't believe what I just heard. You know that young preacher who has that little church down on 5th and Main Street? Yeah, that, that Seventh-day Adventist church? Oh, yes. Yeah, those folk that think Saturday is Sunday. Well, the word is that he snuck off to the justice of peace and got himself married, and you'll never guess who he married. He married that whore, Goma. Oh, shut your mouth. Oh, yes. Tell you lying. I'm not lying. If I'm lying, I'm flying. He married Goma. Seemed like such a fine young man. Now, he must have either been drugged or bewitched. You reckon she hexed him and put something in his food? Lord, help him, poor fella. Curiously, I don't know why Goma consented to marry Jose. It may have been that she was used to going from pillar to pole. She never really had a, a bed or a home that she could call her own. But here now is a substantial man, uh, revered in society, and, and he has asked her to marry him. How can I pass up this chance? It may have been burrowing in its, and, and, and maybe the Christian nerd, but here was her chance. So why not? Or could it be something like Rahab the harlot? who really wanted to do better and to be better. And the moment she got a chance, by faith, she took it. Didn't like that every time she walked down the aisle, Goma, of the church, she could see the church folk leaning over and whispering to each other with a smirk on their face. She could feel their sanctimonious stares on the back of her neck as she sat alone in a pew. Come on, we've got to give her some credit. How many know the church folk can be hard on sinners? She may have had a baby out of wedlock, but that's no worse than your backbiting and your gossiping and your lying and your self-righteous hypocritical lips. At least she knows what she is. Apparently, no sooner than Jose and Goma say, I do, the sparks begin to fly. It is a tumultuous relationship. They are married, all right, but they are not united the way we ought to be. The way to understand this marriage is by examining the names of their three children. In spite of their differences, they begin to produce children. I hope you're quiet because you're listening. They have their first child, and the tenseness in their relationship is indicated by the name of their first child. Their first child is a son, and God names him. God says, call his name Jezreel, for in a little while I shall avenge the blood. Now, it doesn't seem like such a bad name at first. I mean, Jezreel was the name of a town. Not too many people name their name after a after a town, but we named our granddaughter after a country, India, so. <laughs> I shall avenge the blood. Actually, the name has several meanings. It means I will avenge. It means I will punish. But the primary meaning is God sows, like a farmer sowing seed. God sows. It may be that Jose and Goma had decided to give this marriage a try. But what a man or a boy or a girl sows, that shall he also what? Reap. Even though Gomer may have wanted to be good, a good wife, her past kept on catching up with her. There was a restlessness in her soul that only sin can bring. There was a reaping taking place. Remember, visiting the iniquity. There is a weakness there, an inclination to sin. Gomer begins to slip back into her past. She begins to stay out late at night. This causes Hosea great contention. But he has no control. How many times that she comes in two or three o'clock in the morning 
and with her hair disheveled and her clothes uh, undeat and, 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 and the smell of a foreign places on her body or foreign person. Already the kids have been asking, Daddy, where's Mommy? Can't explain. There's a weakness there. They argue and she leaves him for a while. Shows back up later. Returns home again. They patch up their relationship. And Goldmer conceives another child. This time, according to verse 6, it's a girl. They have a daughter. Lord shows up again and says, call her name Lorahama, which means no mercy. Not pity. Apparently, her past lifestyle is such a pull on Gomer that in spite of the fact that she has two children now, one of which is a newborn, all Gomer is concerned about is herself. She only cares about what she wants to do, what makes her happy, what makes her feel good, what adds excitement to her life. She does not really care for this baby. This baby only tends to further restrict her freedom. Therefore, she has no pity, no mercy in her heart for this child. But she stays home long enough to nurse that baby. For according to verse 8, when she has weaned this child, Lorahama, though she had probably determined, determined to leave Hosea and leave Israel and leave Lorahama, she ends up pregnant again. And she conceives and gives birth to a third child. Now, if I was Hosea, by this time I would have run down to the nearest lab and got a DNA test. How many of you would watch that Mori or whatever that show is, where they show up and, oh, no, this is his baby. I don't believe in my baby. Well, we're going to take a test. I'm not the father of this child. Well, we'll see. To the very end, he declares, it's not my child. DNA come back. It's not yours. You're right. <laughs> it's not yours. But Hosea already knew in his heart, this was not his child. Apparently, Hosea shows up the hospital nursery ward. All excited about this new son. Surely this third child will bring Gomer and I closer together. So they direct Hosea down the hall to the nursing room where they have all the little babies. You know, if you've ever uh, had your children and, you, you know, you go to the nursery, you know how you walk down and they, you have this glass and all these little babies are... Or, or in their little, their little buckets, you know, and, and uh, you're walking down anxious to see your child. And, and uh, Jose is looking, and he sees a bucket that has on it Jose Jr. He looks. Now, wait a minute now. That's not my nose. Those are not my eyes. This baby, no, bring me my cow, Hosea, Hosea Jr. <laughs> the nurse behind. Hosea is fit to be tired. This is not my baby. Stomps out of the hospital nursery wing. It's over. I've had enough. Can't take no more. Lord, I knew this was going to happen when you told me to marry this no good woman. Why, Lord? Why are you treating me this way? It's because I want you to know here, sir. And I want my people to know what you are putting me through. That even though we wear the name of Christ and call ourselves Christians, some of us are far from Christ. We wear the name, but we don't look like it. We don't act like it. 
We have lost our identity. We have lost our distinctiveness. We are no longer a peculiar people. There are some institutions that have on the outside Adventists. But when you walk through the door, there's nothing in there that will tell you if it were not for the name, and consequently most of them have taken the name Seventh Day out from it, and they just put Adventists. And when you walk in there, there's nothing that catches your attention to say this is a Seventh Day Adventist institution. They serve coffee. They even have a machine where you can buy cigarettes and any kind of food you desire, they will have. We've lost our peculiar nature. You don't have to stand on your head to be peculiar. You don't have to always carry a Bible under your arm to be peculiar. All you got to do is obey Jesus and keep his commandments and you will be peculiar. There are times when you look at God's church, she looks like everybody else. Got a whole bunch of preachers. Instead of getting their sermons from the word of God and the spirit of prophecy, they're watching these big mega churches, you know, the evangelists. Well, if he's got such a big church, he must be doing something right. I'll copy that. We're beginning to act like them, think like them, wear what they wear, go where they go, and do what they do. And the Lord is crying, well, why call ye me Lord? And do not what I say, Luke 6, 46, Matthew 15, 7, 8. Jesus laments, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Be done soon. Apparently no sooner than she gets out of the hospital, Gomer's back on the street. Hosea is left at home with not one but three children, and he knows that at least one of them is not his child, probably two of them. He's both angry and hurt because even though Gomer has not been faithful in the marriage, Hosea realizes that in spite of himself, he has fallen in love with Gomer. But his pride prevents him from going after it, uh, after her. And it is then that the Lord shows up again in chapter 3, verse 1, and says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet and love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress according to the love of the Lord towards the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So Gomer has a friend now. In fact, it's probably more than a friend. We call them pimps. You see, we have unscrupulous, unwise individuals, both male and female, that think that they are a match for the world, that they can handle themselves. And, 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 but they find out that they're grossly outmatched. And so, she's got a pimp now. And you know what pimps do? Put her to work on the streets. She gains nothing from it herself but hardship and heartache and she's lower than she ever thought she could ever fall. God says, go get her. She's not just unfaithful, she's an adulteress now because she's a married woman. But I want you to go and get her and I want you to love her. How am I going to do this, Lord? You know what she's done to me. Everybody's talking about it. When I go looking from place to place, acting like I'm just taking a stroll, and, and folk know that I'm really looking for Goma. When I knock on the door, I'm, I'm knocking on the door hoping that she's not in there with some stranger. This is a hard thing. You got to do it, Hosea. Go get her. Bring her back. Love her. So as the preacher goes walking through the street looking for his gomer, there's an auction going on. And as he passes by, he sees slaves 
standing on the auction block. And as he looked, as he looked, Bliss, it looked like one of them looked like Goma, but she looked like her, but not really because here she was, unclothed, in spite of all the clothes that he had lavished upon her. Here she stands naked like slaves do. Her hair is not well groomed now, not well oiled with coconut. The mascara is now running down and streaks from her face. She stands there with her chin on her breast, ashamed at the what she had come to. Even her pimp, getting all the use out of her, had nothing left but to put her on the slave block. And as he goes forward and he said, well, Lord, I know you told me to go get it, but it's too late now. It's not too late. The bid is going on. Well, what do I do, Lord? Bid. So Hosea walks up. Oh, Isaac, and very reluctantly, he bids low, almost hoping that somebody's going to overbid him. And someone does, and he's relieved. But Lord says, bid again, Hosea. Bid again. And the bid goes on and on and on until Hosea knows that he's reached this limit because he only has about 30 pieces of silver, whatever the Bible says. And after that, so he bids that. Oxenair says, Going once, going twice, be it, Hosea. I don't have no more money. You got that, that, that bag of barley or whatever it is. Bid that. Throw that in. Hosea throws it in. Once again, as he ponders the bid, he can hear folk making lewd remarks about Gomer and what their plans, the men, the unscrupulous men, what their plans were for her. And it hurts his heart, but he bids again. And by this time, no doubt somebody in the crowd says, ain't that the preacher? Ain't that the preacher? What's he out here doing bidding on that slave up there? Hosea. Here's the words, going once, going twice, sold to this young man. He grabs Gomer off of the stage, takes her back, and as he nears home, his three children, Loami, Loharama, and what's the other one? Yes, here they are coming to meet them. One, not pity, not mine, not my people. And as he's walking with their mother toward them, he's still talking to the Lord. Lord, I don't understand it. I had to give all that I had for this woman. This woman that has hurt me gave everything. The Lord spoke to Hosea. Didn't I give everything for you? I gave everything that I had for you, Hosea. Then Hosea begins to understand that even though Goma was not a person of good repute, he was not much better than Goma because he had become judgmental, he had become hypocritical, and we should not judge either because if it were not for grace, many of us would be even worse off than Goma. And as we look closer at her, at her we understand that there's a little bit of Gomer in each one of us. 
because all of us have sinned and have come short of the glory of God. We've even been pimped. You got to be pimped in order to fall in sin because the great pimper is Satan himself. What have I pimped out to? Have I pimped out to watching the wrong things on TV or late at night on the internet? Have I pimped out on using the money that God has blessed me with to acquire and don't even think enough of him to return one-tenth? Have I pimped out on him because even though he continues to bless me, I don't bother to even pause to say thank you. Yes, we've all been pimped. But thank the Lord. When you get right down to it and you learn what Hosea's name really meant, it was a derivation of Joshua who was a derivation of Jesus. His name actually meant salvation. And so as he takes Gomer's hand and they glass hand with the children, there goes Hosea, followed. Even though people are gossiping, making fun of him, there he is leading his wife and leading those three children that represents Gomer's sins because Jesus has taken our sins upon him. Just as Hosea's name means say, salvation, Gomer's name, according to commentaries, when you break it down, really means not perfect, but hidden that way. Thank you, Jesus. I may not be perfect, but thank God, as well, for the grace of God that continues to grab me, even when I'm in places that I know I should not be in, takes me by the hand and reminds me all the way back in the book of Romans, and the book of Isaiah, that even though there may have been a time that I didn't act like his people, and I was unpitied, that there comes a time because of God's grace that he said, now, you are my people. So I just, if you play something, we're going to call for those that in some way have realized or recognized the Gomer in them. And you understand that we don't have to wallow in filth. We don't have to wallow in sin. In fact, we got no time to waste in sin. But there's a Savior that loves us, that will take us right where he finds us. Put his robe of righteousness around us. And one day will take us home to be with him. If you've been able to spot the Gomer in you, if I've been able to spot the Gomer in me, won't you let the Savior lead you? As we ask Pastor to prepare to give us a prayer of rededication, won't you come? As I present myself, if you want to join me, those of you who have spotted the Gomer in yourself and understand that we are no match. We're no match for sin as you're coming. I know that Satan is even now whispering to some of you, ah, oh, what you did is too bad. You can't overcome it. I used to watch the nature programs. In Maxwell, there was a program called The Bear. This little bear, this little baby cub bear, grizzly bear, was out with his mother, having come through the winter of hibernation, foraging for food, and in the crevice of these rocks, it found a, a beehive, a honeycomb, and as the mother bear was clawing, trying to get to the honey, there were some rocks above that were unstable and unsteady, and they fell down upon the mother grizzly, killed her. The little bear 
not understanding what was going on, stayed by the mother's bare, bare body for some time until hunger began to hit and the little bear went out searching. And as he was searching, it came to the attention the little bear saw a, another bear over in the distance. Now, it was a male grizzly. And generally, mother bears will protect little cubs from the male grizzly because male grizzly, uh, grizzly have been known to kill little cubs. But the little bear didn't know any, any better, so it goes up to the, 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 uh, the, the, the bear, the, the male bear, the papa bear. The bear didn't want anything to do with it, have anything to do with it, at least it didn't kill it. But eventually there was a bond that came between uh, the, the, this male bear and this little cub. And one day again, as little cubs are off to do, they begin to wander off and lost sight and contact with the male bear. And then something terrible happened. There was a mountain lion on the prowl for something to eat, spotted this little defenseless little bear and began to head toward that little bear. And when the little bear spotted the mountain lion, he knew this was going to be bad and it just took off running. Came to a cliff and there was a, there was a tree that had fallen and it had and fallen over, over, over this stream, this, this chasm. And the little bear crawled out on that. Mountain lion just took his time because mountain lion just knew, well, I got him now. Where's he going to go? And as the mountain lion began to go toward the bear, the bear's looking around, he's looking down, he, he knows, you know, he can't do anything. Mountain lion comes, and just as he's about to pounce on the little bear, the little bear raised back his head, gave out a squeal, and then a strange thing happened. The mountain lion froze in his tracks and began to back up, Pooja. And you begin to wonder, well, what happened? Certainly that mountain lion was afraid of that little squeal, little bear. But then the camera changed position, Sam. And you saw what the little bear didn't see, but what the hungry lion saw right behind the little bear appeared Papa Bear raised up and that lion knowing that he was no match began to back off we're that little bear we're defenseless but thank god we've got a father in heaven a papa bear that will take on the devil every time no matter what the sin no matter what the habit he will make us victorious if we'll just trust him. Pastor, won't you come and pray as we rededicate ourselves to the Lord, as we ask him to deal with the gomer in us, that we may in fact experience a new relationship with Christ. Merciful Father in heaven. How blessed it was for us to spend our time in your presence. Thank you for giving us the time to listen to your words coming through your servant. Merciful Father, thank you for reminding us again that we are wretched sinners, lost in sin. But your grace and grace alone has lifted us up. We were stuck in the mighty clay of sin, but you lifted us up and put us on the solid rock of salvation. So, Lord, we want to thank you for being such a God. A God who has been seeking after us even while we were at sinners. Even in the Garden of Eden, we saw that, Lord, that you, 6,000 years ago, when Adam and Eve sinned, it is not they who came, in after, came after you, but you went after them. And we want to thank you, Lord, that you came after us 2,000 years ago were born as a little baby in Bethlehem, lived a perfect life to set an example for us, to have died for us on the cross at Calvary, rose upon the third day, won the victory over death once for all, and today you have promised to come back to take us home. And so, Lord, because of what you have done, because of the victory that you have won over death, that we, when we choose to be on your side, we are on the victory side. And so, Lord, thank you so much for reminding us today through your servant that we have in many ways 
have walked away from you. And so, Lord, we, as weak and feeble and sinful as we are, I plead with you and I beg you and I beseech you that you would draw us back to you again. And give us the strength, give us the victory over the weaknesses that each one of us have. We know each one of our hearts, Lord. I know my own weaknesses. And so, Lord, give me your grace and allow me to overcome them with your power so that I may live a victorious Christian life. And that is the desire of every one of us who are, in the, who are within the hearing of my voice. And so, Lord, please, just as it was driven home very forcefully through your servant today, that we don't have to fear because right behind us you are there to save us. And you are mightier than this, mightier than Satan. We may not be able to see you, but the devil can see you, Lord, that he is, that you have put a fence around us. And so, Lord, I plead with you that you would put a hedge around us. May your Holy Spirit surround us at all times so that we would be always under the shadow of your wings. Thank you, Lord, for the amazing grace that you have shown to us. Abide with us, and please accept our dedication this morning. So I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.